It is now 8 in the morning on February 18th. It's Monday, and I'm going to read the dreams from yesterday that I didn't have a chance to read yet. These are from the morning of February 17th, so... Right? Yes. So, um, basically, it was the night of February 16th, morning of February 17th. And um, it's interesting here that the first dream is from 2.33, because I can tell, reading through them, that they are all connected to Freemasonry. That number 33, and also the number 2, and also the number 32... Um, and then isn't the Skull and Bones Society, isn't their number 322? So this is 233. Kind of interesting. The times seem to matter. So I do try to, I do try to look at the clock when I write them down. Like it's, I feel like they try to um, time these dreams so that I'm writing them at a specific time. On a plane, person on the other end keep, oh, on a phone. Can't read my writing. On a phone, person on the other end keeps hanging up, keeps putting down phone. On okay, on a phone, on phone, person on other end keeps me hanging, keeps putting down phone. Hostile person, supposed to be helping me. White powder, wake up, see. Images on a map, like an A sideways, maybe. Um, it says dots, but I'm not sure what that other part is. So, like, is it on edge? Dots on the edges, maybe. So, like a map, like kind of like that. But not where I have a really distinctive thing that I can draw, like a really distinctive structure that I can draw, just lots of stuff. But I sense, I have the sense of curved edges. So something with curved edges and maybe... um. Yeah, okay. So for 2.46 a.m., then, I write, Vision makes me think someone was pushed over a ridge, hurt or killed, or hurt then killed, and this has caused ongoing problems. Now, I've just realized that when this, when I had this dream, I had the sense of this curved edge being like an edge, like you could fall over the edge. Um, maybe. Partly... But also, it seems like it related to that dream where I was looking for the dead-end roads around the Bayshore Mall. Um, I mean, the dead, the dream was about a dead-end road near the Bayshore Mall, so then I went and looked on the map. So, um, anyway, it's, it might be connected to that map also. Idea of someone being pushed over a ridge and hurt or killed or hurt then killed, and this has caused ongoing problems. So this is actually, I'm just going to say what I think this means now. I think this is, um, in the context of all these other dreams that I'm having the same night, I think this is about a way of setting up a situation. I mean, it might also describe something that actually happened to someone, and it obviously describes something that could have happened to me. Well, obvious to me anyway. Um, I'm trying to explain that situation still. But something I was talking about with Chris after I woke up from this dream, probably because it's part of what this is about, is how different things in each of our lives were created, different situations, very extreme situations were created, partly, I think, as they were architected, they were designed in order to make people not want to let us out of this trap. And in his case, it's connected to his music career and other people's music careers who got real famous, people like, you know, Kurt Cobain and anybody who is connected with Sub Pop, for example. Um, and in my case, and there's other things like that too, but that's probably the biggest. There's other things. In my case, it seems to be murders. It looks to me like it's murders. and medical trafficking, and stuff having to do with universities. So in his case, it's the entertainment industry, the music industry. In my case, it's probably the university systems that are most concerned about the truths coming out, about the things that happened. 
There might be even more than that. That's what's coming to my mind right now. Then the next image is Phyllis from The Office. That's a character from the TV series called The Office. And then just associated with either a poo emoji or dirt. The reason why I think Phyllis from The Office is in here, other than the fact that Chris and I started watching The Office, because it comes on the one of the channels that we watch, like to watch, is that Phyllis is married to someone named Bob Vance, who's kind of like um, this... Um, business community big shot in this town of Scranton, Missouri. And like so many TV series, the name, well, you know, like some other series, but Vance is um, an important name in Humboldt County. There's a guy named, um, I think his name was John Vance, who was um, one of those big deal... who was one of those big deal rich guys that seemed to be so important in the formation of the Northwest. So I don't want to call them necessarily robber barons. I don't know that they're all robber barons. But what these guys are, they tend to be these guys from the 19th century who were early on the scene after the Native Americans were driven out of their homes and, um, you know, um, onto reservations or killed. These guys acquired the land pretty quickly. Um, they often, I don't know if they're always from wealthy families or, you know, um, there seems to be certain patterns with these guys. Maybe it has to do with um, heritage, you know, with family heritage or something like that. I'm not sure. But they, they acquire land and they're smart about business usually. And um, they just build, build, build. And um, they tend to be, involved let's see they tend to be involved with logging i'm talking about these guys from the 19th century like 1860s 70s 80s you'll see that they almost all are involved with logging or mining or some sort of natural resource extraction um in humboldt county sometimes it's farming and dairy um Now, Vance in Eureka, banking is another big one. Banking's big. Um, Vance in Eureka was involved with a whole bunch of stuff. Um, anyway, Phyllis from the office is dating someone named Bob Vance of Vance Refrigeration. So there are roads and places and things like that named after um, John Vance in Eureka. And... I think it's just this idea of this sort of big, but big deal guy in town, or somebody who's descended from a big from a big deal family, um, and maybe is showing me a little bit of a link between Freemasonry and maybe somebody like Phyllis, who would be dating, <laughs> you know, um, a guy like Bob Vance or John Vance or something like that. And so there's this idea with me of people throwing dirt on me, like that's like a sport. People look at that as a sport. So it's something that I've been talking about, you know, masonry, but obviously it's way more than people who are um, specifically Freemasons. It's, it's incorporated into all facets of the community, their communities. And then as far as this whole thing with um, throwing dirt on me or slandering me or um, somehow getting access to this hidden camera footage and using it as a type of slander, that's what I've discerned is going on in the background and has been going on for quite some time. And um, so I think this is just <clears throat> this just a small little image just kind of illustrating a, kind of how it's working. Okay, now here I write 1210. What's going on? Am I on the wrong day or is this a different day? No, okay, well what this is, is is me taking a nap. So, okay, so that was, this was, this last image was from, you know, 3 in the morning. Then the next thing I get is at 1210 in the afternoon on the 17th. Walking down a trail, first like Lad's Edition, later like a forest trail, sort of like the rock quarry behind our house when we were growing up. So then I, I said, okay, well, Lad's Edition is interesting to me because it's got a curved road in it, and I dreamt of um, a map with curved edges earlier. 
So maybe there's something about that. And I saw a couple things about Lad's Edition. One I saw is that it actually looks a little bit like a dream map that I drew in the early 90s. Um, but I started to read all about Lad's Edition. It's one of the oldest neighborhoods in Portland. And, it, you know, this guy Lad was another one of these guys, the big deal guy in town kind of guy, the guy that was instrumental in building the library downtown, that kind of guy. So he's a lot like John Vance in, in Humboldt County. I've talked about M.P. Roberts, Melvin Parker Roberts. Um, he was, Ladd was an early mayor of Portland. So I started getting all kinds of other information coming in because just because of the people who were around this guy, Ladd. Like, I think the mayor that succeeded Ladd, was last name was Starr, S-T-A-R-R, -R, like Ringo Starr. Well, Ringo Starr is a stage name. I also have dreamt about rings recently. So it's just weird how these things link and link and link. And then you start seeing the same names show up again and again and again. And so here there seems to be a link between the Lads edition and this rock quarry behind my home. So I want to figure out what that is. I've been wondering and trying to find online what exactly this rock quarry was all about. Who used it? Who, you know, who owned it at least? But who used it, you know, when it was, you know, whatever I can find out about it. I don't know anything about it. I used to walk up there all the time, I probably even on a daily basis for a period of time with my dog. I used to take my dog on long walks through the woods and end up at this rock quarry. Um, and it's figured into my dreams as a site for murders and things like that. So I'm, And then I found out there was a mo movie from 1947 called Red House where a murder happens in a rock quarry. And there's all kinds of other things about that movie that make me think it, you know, made me realize, actually, that whatever was going to, what whatever was happening to me in my childhood had been planned out at least since that movie came out, Red House, in 1947. Um, so I also knew, because I had done research on um, my parents' land in the 90s, that my friend Melinda's family purchased land, their land, and maybe, you know, a larger chunk of land that they eventually whittled down, I'm not sure, but purchased um, land on Redmond Road in 1946, the year before this movie came out. I also know that True Hoyle, the granddaughter of Melvin Parker Roberts, grew up in Melinda's house, so that's a straight line, as far as I can tell, of Freemasonry from of about a hundred years that I can trace through Melinda's, you know, family. So um, maybe her father, who has also done research on the properties and things, will know who used this rock quarry. And um, then I can maybe find out, is there an actual link that I can trace to Lad's edition in Portland? That'd be interesting to find out. Okay, then I have an image of a police officer police officer puts me in handcuffs, maybe at the office I'm standing up for myself. So I'm trying to assert and stand up for myself. And I think this might be at Lewis and Clark College and a police officer puts me in handcuffs. I think this is just a, um, relating to me publishing that fake, you know, I mean, I don't know what else you could call it. I could, I could love to have some, see some due process on it and everything, but um, it's that fake mental health diagnosis they made on me in January 2014. Um, it has all kinds of factual, um, you know, to say lie says it's intentional, which I do think it was intentional, but it has factual incorrect <laughs> things in it as well as diagnoses that seem not even remotely correct. But anyway, um, I think this might be just sort of illustrating kind of what was going on with that. Maybe, maybe some something else, because it feels like this is at the Lewis and Clark College office. But again, that might have to do with hidden cameras at Lewis and Clark College, because, again, mind control things. 2005, so um, a lot of stuff ha was happening to me while I was working at Lewis and Clark College, probably to sabotage me at that job and in life including um, uh, deliberately making me think I had, you know, some sort of anxiety disorder, panic disorder, um, getting me on Ativan, which is a very weird drug, as well as torturing me with back implants, which means that I was also taking opiates, 
And then I also had all kinds of issues trying to take care of my daughter, trying to make ends meet. Um, that's probably what this is about. This is probably people going back and through this illegal, Fourth Amendment violating, hidden camera footage. Because, uh, you know, that's what I think. Um, and um, trying to use it to defame me with covertly behind the scenes. That's what I think. Um, so, 9.08 p.m. I write, dream of someone who misrepresents himself. Image is cleaning around a toilet, thick, built-up goop. Yeah, like this really thick goop around a toilet. Ick. The person has gone back on a promise, misrepresented himself. Sense of a military, sense of military may be connected with what is on TV at that time. Police in the color red. I think these dreams are not, I think if they're, they end up being connected to the TV that's on the time, most of the time it's because they deliberately connected to the TV shows. Um, but, you know, TV was on, Chris was watching TV when I fell asleep and had this dream. Just probably cleaning around the toilet, thick built-up goop is probably, you know, it's just a chore people have to do. But in this case, it's really thick, so it might also be, um, you know, it's associated with cleaning things. Cleaning a bathroom specifically. Um, but since it's military and police and the color red, this again, this kind of like, for me, confirms that the whole thing is about Freemasonry. Because... That's the one thing that connects all of these things. I don't know what else. I'm sure red has other types of meanings for military and possibly other types of meanings for police. You know, it's the stoplight, of course, and things like that. But um, to me, what connects military police in the color red is um, Royal Arch Masons.